Welcome to a brand new edition of Dead Games No One Played. This time with a favorite of mine, a game I was itching to try for so many years. The cancelled Sony Online Entertainment MMO dubbed The Agency. The game began development roughly around the year 2004 five or 2006 it was being developed by the people at fire and that became part of the big sony online entertainment family when they were bought and renamed sony online entertainment seattle fire Ant was made up of a lot of people from microsoft from electronic arts from origin well still electronic arts and they worked on the agency for about six years the game was officially unveiled at e3 in 2007 and i remember being blown away by it for some context at the time the majority of the mmos you would find on the market were world of warcraft things that world of warcraft killed an infinite number of Korean and the Chinese MMOs that were basically Satan's asshole in terms of design, a post screw up Star Wars Galaxies, a still good EVE Online, alongside a dying Ultima Online, and a mostly abandoned Anarchy Online. Let's just say it wasn't a very good place for MMOs at the time. The Burning Crusade was released just a couple of months before. No no one cared about other MMOs in World of Warcraft. They just got flying mounts and people went insane. And yet there it was, the agency, an MMO that promised to deliver something that, well, MMOs did not really do well up until that time. Shooting mechanics. Like including SOE's own planet side, you know, the one with hit scan weapons, the first one that was made like that because it was made to work on modems built by cavemen. It promised to be even more of a shooter than Tabula Rasa would be later that year, a game developed by this nation games under Richard Garriott and subsequently murdered in its sleep by NC Soft. But it wasn't the fact that this was a shooter MMO that draw me to it. It was the fact that this game, this MMO, had a theme. One that you will not see probably ever again in an actual big budget MMO. Espionage. Not as a gimmick, not as a little thing, summer stuff in the corner, no, no, no. This game had espionage front and center. That's what it was about. The story and setting were, well, they weren't all that fleshed out by the time it was cancelled in 2011, but we did get tidbits and hints regarding regarding what it was all about. Namely, there were these two agencies, espionage agencies. One of them was Unite, a team of elite, James Bond, Jameson Bourne type people that would go undercover, that would use sophisticated technology to uncover plots and overthrow evil doers of international evil things. They would focus on stealth and subterfuge and gadgets and martinis and tuxedos. And then you had Paragon. They focused on having big guns, blowing stuff up, using duct tape in industrial quantities and explosives, usually in combination. These were not opposing factions and that's one of the things I liked about the idea of the game. They were not enemies. You could say that on a certain level the Horde and the Alliance aren't enemies apart from when they kill each other constantly, but these were not enemies. They were sometimes competing agencies for the same contracts, but they would work together most of the time. That was enforced even in the trailers. And as a fresh recruit of one of these two agencies, you would go around the world and solve, well, problems. Evil dictators, terrorists, people that have not yet seen an exploding teddy bear being exploded by one, because this game had exploding teddy bears. It had a certain sense of style that harkened a bit to Get Smart. For those who don't know, Get Smart was a comedy espionage series that aired in the 60s on US television and then the 90s in Eastern Europe. It was brilliant, it had humor, it had wit, it was probably responsible for Austin Powers existing and just about every other spy spoof ever made. And the agency had a similar sense of humor about itself. It, it knew it was kind of ridiculous. It wasn't amped up to 11, but it did have a sort of cartoony 
vibe to it. Again, with the exploding teddy bears, you would see in your base of operation at the gadgets department an ever-changing lineup of gadgets being tested in the background, like exploding teddy bears. The world was built in a sort of hub-like structure with different areas that you could explore. You had your central base, for example, Unite was sitting in a flower shop that extended underground to levels that were a bit ridiculous and there you would have all sorts of facilities. You could go to the lounge and talk to other players, you could go and see a mission briefing, you could try out your skills in the firing range, you even had an arcade. Sony Online Entertainment actually were bragging about this, this thing. They had the rights to Qbert, so they put Qbert in there as a minigame. They put a lot of minigames in there. You, you could play poker, you could play blackjack. You actually had blackjack as an objective in some missions. After all, this was an espionage game, and how could you not have something that reminds people of Casino Royale? And when you got tired of lounging around your base, you could go on missions. Some of them could be in the city that your base was in, so you didn't have to go through any loading screen, well, not big ones. You could go outside, walk down the street, see some people that could be your contacts or your targets, you had to sneak by them, you had to follow them, you had to plant bugs on them, you had to do spyish things. Like, this game had an actual stealth system, which I saw in action at one of the presentations. Sneaking worked a bit differently than it does in games that don't actually have a sneaking system like the secret world, but pretend they do, or every other MMO by the way, you had aliases that you made for your character, which sort of acted like a secondary health bar, and if the enemy noticed you, like if they noticed you doing something that you shouldn't be, that alias would be damaged to the point where it would be revealed as being a fake identity, and then you had to fight them. And this could happen in a public place, like uh, most of the game happened in public spaces where other players did their own missions. And eventually you would get to an area where you had to either sneak around completely because you would be shot, again if you unite and you care about being stealthy, silent, subtle, or if you were in Paragon, or if you just didn't care, you could go in guns blazing, explode everything, and everybody died. But the thing is that um, this game was a shooter. They, they made a point of reminding people that they hired some of the developers of Modern Warfare, which was a big hit back then, to work on the shooting mechanics. They said a headshot will kill you. No matter who fires it, a headshot will kill you. Even if it's PvE, even if it's PvP. If a level 1 new headshots a max level player, that player is dead. And that's one of the things I loved about the promise of this game. It was an even playing field. Yeah, yeah, the max level player had better guns, had better tools. The max level player could kill you and all your friends and look cool while doing it. But if you're actually good, you could take him down. Same goes for the AI. The missions had variable difficulty, so in a standard difficulty, yeah, you could probably go in and solo everything, but on higher levels, you probably needed help. And help came in two forms. You had, again, you had uh, human players and you had operatives. The game actually had a, a Facebook tying game which was actually released, unlike this one, that centered around those operatives. You would gain them in the agency by completing certain missions and then making sure they were loyal enough to you and they were basically your lackeys. You could take them with you in missions and you could actually send them in missions by themselves. And this is one of the things I, I liked about this game. And one of the things everybody stole. You could send these characters on missions on their own while you are not in the game. This was 2007, no one was doing this. But then, you know, Star Trek Online started doing it, which was released a lot of years later. Star Wars The Old Republic did this after the agency got cancelled. World of Warcraft was doing this with Warlords of drainer everybody's doing this now but then no no one did it back then and still nobody does it the way the agency intended to do it these these agents you would send out on missions were not just 
completely independent. They did not just roll a die and see what happened. They would encounter situations which required your input. They would give you a choice of what they should do, how they should proceed. And because you were not in game at the time, there needed to be some way for you to interact with them. And they came up with the idea of sending you a text message on your phone to which you could reply and give an instruction. I believe they gave an example at one time that one of your operatives had actually been captured and you had the opportunity to, I believe, pay a ransom or try and find a way to get them free by sending other people or just basically activating a mission for you to go and get them. But I'm not sure about this one anymore because it's been roughly nine years since then. Why a text message? Why not an app? Because smartphones were not a thing back then. This was before the iPhone was released. Yeah, sure, smartphones were still a thing back then, but not the smartphone we know it as it is now. Not the, oh my god, I have an app for everything kind of smartphone. The agency was years ahead of its time in this area. Not only did the people at SOE Seattle come up with the idea of these agents, but you could also interact with them in a way in which you even couldn't in the other MMOs, which implemented the feature years, years later, would let you do. Was there an app for Star Wars Your Republic that let you interact with your peeps on your phone? No, there wasn't. Even now there isn't one. And yet SOE was building that infrastructure since 2007. And when you went on those missions to rescue your operatives, maybe somewhere in the jungle or somewhere in a very remote place, well, you would not walk there. You, you would transition there in something like a plane, you would have to go to the airport. And uh, because the maps themselves would be, I believe they said they would be kind of big, you would actually have drivable vehicles in the game. You would have cars, you would have boats. I do believe there were helicopters at one point or either airplanes. There were aerial vehicles at any rate. And the missions, as I've said before, were not all focused on shoot everyone and hope the right people die. You had more spy things to do. You had to infiltrate something like a banquet party. It wasn't all grind and no substance. It actually looked like it would be a fine game. One that was fun, one where the shooting mechanics made sense, where you could enjoy yourself, not just shoot a bajillion bullets into a boss and then be called a COD fanboy by a Ubisoft employee because you thought a division had crappy combat and nothing else. The last time I saw the agency was at SOE Fanfare in 2010. There wasn't much actual fanfare about the game back then, they didn't show any new trailers, any new bombastic stuff, they were just talking about class balance and class devices, gadgets, designing classes and skills and abilities, and a few months later there came the announcement. The agency, an MMO that would be released for the PlayStation 3 and Windows PC, was dead. Reasons are aplenty. Mostly because Sony Online Entertainment was going through some rough patches, Sony itself was going through some rough patches, and they closed off a lot of studios, SOE Seattle being one of them. SOE itself would later become Daybreak and be sold to a third party because Sony didn't know what to do with it anymore. Sony. Sony owned the creators of the modern MMO. Sony would have had with the agency an MMO that broke the mold completely and could have actually been better suited to consoles than some other MMOs because again this was at its basis a shooter, one that actually had shooting mechanics in it. But they decided to kill it and eventually to get rid of Sony Online Entertainment entirely, which itself decided to kill EverQuest next, and at, at least they managed to launch Planet Side 2. Which is nothing like the agency would have been, but still, it's an MMO shooter and at least we have that. And of the agency, all we have left is some scattered gameplay footage and a bunch of trailers with Cassie and Duncan, which would have been your main con and sometimes partners on your mission 
relations with United Paragon. It just boggles the mind sometimes how nobody thought to cancel the Elder Scrolls Online, a completely pointless WoW clone with about as much life in it as Warhammer Age of Reckoning, but someone did cancel an MMO where you could kill somebody with an exploding teddy bear. That's just not right. Thank you for watching this show. If you enjoyed it, please consider watching some of our other videos and maybe sharing them or giving a thumbs up if you feel like it. And if you really, really liked what you saw, please check out our Patreon page. For just $1 a month, you could help us make much better shows and get some rewards in the process. Or you could consider buying my book called Tale of Doom. Volume 1 is out now and available for just $2. And as always, if you thought it was horrible, you know where to find me and complain about it.